Halcyon by Plato, translated by Brad Inwood. Introduction. Socrates tells his devoted friend, Caraphon, the legend of Halcyon, who was transformed by some heavenly power into a seabird, the better to search for her much-beloved husband, who had drowned at sea. Caraphon doubts the truth of the legend, but Socrates argues that his doubt is unfounded. We are ignorant of the limits of divine power, which is unimaginably greater than human power, and has shown itself to be capable of tremendous things. The topic and setting of this lyrical little dialogue appear to be derived from a passage in Plato's Phaedrus, where Socrates also interprets a legend about the transformation of human beings into animals. The association between cosmos, heaven, nature, and divine power is characteristic of Platonism in later times, as is the skeptical stress on the limits of human knowledge, and the affinity between human beings and other animals. The dialogue is elaborately cultivated, both in vocabulary and composition, and is a good example of the artificial style called Asiatic by later critics. It was probably composed between 150 BC and 50 AD. The ending of Halcyon contains a sly allusion to the story of the two wives of Socrates, Xanthope and Myrto, both of whom, he hopes, will be as devoted to him as Halcyon was to her husband. This story of the bigamy of Socrates goes back to the 4th century BC at least. Although many manuscripts attribute Halcyon to Plato, and an ancient book list records it as being among the works incorrectly ascribed to him, it has virtually disappeared from the Platonic Corpus. This is because it was later attributed to Lucian, the 2nd century AD orator and dialogue writer, probably by a Byzantine scholars who noticed similarities with the methods and themes of Lucian. When the Corpus of Platonic Works was established for modern times in the 16th century edition of Henri Etienne, Stephanus, Halcyon was not printed, and has normally not been printed in other modern editions of Plato. It is nowadays usually printed only in editions of the Lucianic Corpus. D.S.H. Halcyon. Caraphon. Socrates. What was that voice that reached us from way down along the beach, under the headland? It was so sweet to my ears. What creature can it be that makes that sound? Surely creatures that live in the sea are silent. Socrates. It's a sort of seabird, Caraphon. It's called the Halcyon. Much given to lamenting and weeping. There's an ancient account about this bird, which is handed down as a myth by men of old. They say it was once a woman, the daughter of Aeolus, the son of Helen, who ached with love and lamented the death of her wedded husband, Cakes of Trachis, the son of Eosphorus, the dawn star, a handsome son of a handsome father. And then, through some act of divine will, she grew wings like a bird, and now flies about the sea searching for him, since she could not find him when she wandered all over the face of the earth. Caraphon. Is it Halcyon that you're referring to? I had never heard the voice before. It really did strike me as something exotic. Anyway, the creature certainly does produce a mournful sound. About how big is it, Socrates? Socrates. Not very large. Yet great is the honor she has been given by the gods because of her love for her husband. For it's when the Halcyons are nesting that the cosmos brings us what are called the Halcyon days in midwinter. Days distinguished by their fair weather. Today is an especially good example. Don't you see how bright the sky above is, and how the whole sea is calm and tranquil? Like a mirror, so to speak. Caraphon. You're right, today does seem to be a Halcyon day. And yesterday was much like it. But by the gods, Socrates, how can we actually believe those ancient tales? That once upon a time, birds turned into women or women into birds. All that sort of thing seems utterly impossible. Socrates. Ah, my dear Caraphon, we seem to be utterly short-sighted judges of what is possible or impossible. We make our assessment according to the best of our human ability, which is unknowing, unreliable, and blind. Many things which are feasible seem to us not feasible, and many things which are attainable seem unattainable, often because of our inexperience, and often because of the childish folly of our minds. For in fact, all human beings, even very old men, really do seem to be as foolish as children. Since the span of our lives is small indeed, 
no longer than childhood when compared with all eternity. My good friend, how could people who know nothing about the powers of the gods and divinities, or of nature as a whole, possibly tell whether something like this is possible or impossible? Did you notice, Carafun, how big a storm we had the day before yesterday? Someone pondering those lightning flashes and thunderbolts and the tremendous force of the winds might well be struck by fear. One might have thought the whole inhabited world was actually going to collapse, but a little later, there's an astounding restoration of fair weather, which has lasted right up to the present moment. Do you think, then, that it is a greater and more laborious task to conjure up this kind of fair weather out of such an overwhelming storm and disturbance, and to bring the entire cosmos into a state of calm, than it is to reshape a woman's form and turn it into a bird's? Even our little children, who know how to model such things out of clay or wax, can easily work them into all kinds of shapes, all out of the same material. Since the divinity possesses great power, incomparably greater than ours, perhaps all such things are actually very easy for it. After all, how much greater than yourself would you say that the whole of heaven is? Caraphon. Socrates, who among men could imagine or find words for anything of the sort? Even to say it is beyond human attainment. Socrates. When we compare people with each other, do we not see that there are vast differences in their ability and inabilities? Adult men, when compared to mere infants, who are 5 or 10 days old, have an amazing superiority in their ability at virtually all the practical affairs of life, those carried out by means of our sophisticated skills as well as those carried out by means of the body and soul. These things cannot, as I said, even cross the minds of young children. And how immeasurably superior is the physical strength of one man grown to full size compared to them, for one man could easily vanquish thousands of such children, and it is surely natural that in the initial stages of life, men should be utterly helpless and incapable of anything. When one person, as it seems, is so far superior to another, how are we to suppose that the powers of the whole heaven would appear, compared with our powers, to those who are capable of grasping such matters? Perhaps, indeed, many people will think it plausible that, just as the size of the cosmos surpasses the form of Socrates or Caraphon, so its power and wisdom and intelligence will to the same degree surpass our condition. For you and me and many others like us, many things are impossible which are quite easy for others to do. For as long as they lack the knowledge, it is more impossible that people who cannot play the flute should do so, or that the illiterate should read or write, than it is to make women out of birds or birds out of women. Nature virtually tosses into a honeycomb an animal which is footless and wingless, then she gives it feet and wings, adorns it with all kinds of variegated and beautiful colors, and so produces a bee, wise producer of heavenly honey. And from mute and lifeless eggs, she shapes many species of winged, walking, and water-dwelling animals, using, as some say, the sacred arts of the vast ether. We are mortal and utterly trivial, unable to see clearly either great or small matters, and in the dark about most of the things which happen to us. So we could not possibly make any reliable claim about the mighty powers of the immortals, whether as regards halcyons or as regards nightingales. O bird of musical lamentations, I shall pass on to my children the far-famed myth about your songs, just as I received it from my ancestors. And I shall sing frequently to my wives, Xanthope and Myrto, of your piety and loving devotion to your husband, with special emphasis on the honor you receive from the gods. Will you too do something like this, Caraphon? Caraphon. That would certainly be appropriate, Socrates, and what you say is a double exhortation to the bond between husbands and wives. Socrates. Well, now it's time to bid farewell to Halcyon, and go on to the city from Cape Phaleron. Caraphon. Certainly, let's do so. End of Halcyon.